the theme of our afternoon service or sermon is God's providence. And, and there are many texts in the Bible that one could read that will serve this topic or that will speak to this topic and open it up. And, and surely I will, through the sermon, refer to those uh, uh, Bible verses. But let us read uh, just one of them now, and that is from the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 22 to 34. And you may remember that Acts chapter 17, those verses are all about the Apostle Paul uh, on his way from Thessalonica in the north and Berea down to Corinth. He got stuck in Athens. And as he was walking around waiting for Timothy to, to come to him and, and Silas, he saw all the, the pagan statues of the Athenians. And then we read in verse 22, So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would see God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, but others said, We shall hear you again concerning this. So Paul went out of their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Thus far the reading from God's word. We will also be reminded of how the Westminster Confession pastors in the 1600s, how they wrote about God's providence. And so I will read to you, and unfortunately, due to COVID restrictions, you don't have these booklets in the pew, but I will read to you from page 107, just one small paragraph. That is the Westminster Confessions, chapter 5, paragraph 1. God, the great creator of all things, upholds, directs, 
It disposes and governs all creatures, actions, and things, from the greatest even to the least. He exercises this most wise and holy providence according to his infallible foreknowledge and the free and unchangeable counsel of his own will. And then we sang about that in one, number 179. It says, this all to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. And so human beings, sinful human beings, summarized a truth about God's providence. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible teaches us that that which our God, the Almighty Creator, has created, that which He has made, that He will not neglect, that He will provide for. And so our sermon has the following three points. The extent of God's providence, the goodness of God's providence, and the glory of God's providence. So perhaps to try and remember it, it's E-G-G, egg. So the extent, the goodness, and glory. First then, the extent of God's providence. My brother and sister, Westminster Confession 5, Article 1, based upon God's word, says... God, the great creator of all things, upholds, directs, disposes, and governs, and then we hear the word, all creatures, all actions, and all things, from the greatest even to the least. Well, we want to focus our hearts and minds on the word all in governs all. And so you see God's care of creation is not a mere basic maintenance program. Now we hear the words, he upholds, he directs, and he governs all creatures, all actions, and all things. So you might ask, but but where did the Westminster Assembly get it from that God upholds, directs, disposes, and governs all creatures, actions, and things? Well, from several Bible verses. Here is the first one, a very known passage and very important passage, Colossians 1, verse 17 where it says about our Lord Jesus Christ, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All things were created through him and for him. And then we hear the words, and in him all things hold together. So see, the extent of God's providence. In him all things hold together. It's the son of God's love. It's Jesus Christ who holds in his almighty hands as God the reins of the universe and never even for one moment lets them slip out of his grip. No wonder the Apostle Paul in, in our New Testament passage tells the Areopagites, God gives all men life and breath and everything else. And he determines the times set for all men and the exact places where they should live. And then he says, in him we live. And that's we all. We all live and move and have our being. And remember, even the pagan king 
Nebuchadnezzar, when he was brought low by God Almighty, he acknowledged the extent of God's providence. Just, just here again, Nebuchadnezzar's profession of faith. He says that before God, all, do you hear the extent? All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And God does according to his will among the host of heaven. Again, we hear words of extent. And among the inhabitants of the earth. And then we hear another word of extent. When it says, and none can stay his hand. Can, in other words, can block his hand or say to him, what have you done? My brother and sister, what gladness. Yes, what comfort for the Christian to know that God upholds, that he directs, that he disposes and governs all creatures, actions, and things. Consider the word directs in the phrase God directs all creatures, actions, and things. Does not this knowledge give great, great comfort to believers in their hardship on earth? Yes, even to those beloved members of our congregation who are currently suffering hardship. Does it not give peace to even the persecuted Christian when he or she knows that be their circumstances ever so dire and be they even oppressed by earthly kings who seem so powerful, God is the ruler yet and can overturn even the most selfish dictatorial rule. And if he does not, then it's also good. Remember, for example, how it was said that the city of Babylon in the days of King Belshazzar was impregnable? That city, city could not be taken. Its defenses were so good, and the king and his soldiers were so certain about that, that they drank wine and partied till deep into the night. And while drinking and eating from the gold and silver vessels, that they got where from? Well, that they got from God's temple in Jerusalem. And then suddenly, the writing was literally on the wall for this powerful and oppressing ruler. Yes, suddenly a, a disembodied hand wrote on the wall, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Ufarsin, which literally means numbered, numbered, weighed, and divided. For God had numbered the days of this arrogant ruler, and God had weighed him in the scales, and he was found wanting. And God had divided his boastful kingdom. And that very night, the impregnable city was taken and Belshazzar killed. How did that happen? How was that possible? Well, you may remember that historians tell us that the enemy, the Medes and the Persians, dried up the Euphrates River, exactly there where the river went underneath Babylon's city wall. And so with the river dried up, the soldiers simply walked underneath the city wall and took mighty Babylon without much effort. My brother and sister, keeping in mind the Bible verses mentioned before and also this event in history, that this did not happen without the Almighty God's providential 
directing hand. Yes, Belshazzar thought that he was safe, but in the providence of God, he was defeated. Which reminds me of one of my favorite verses in the Psalms. Psalm 33, verse 16. A king is not saved by his great army. Indeed, the extent of God's providence is seen in the fact that he upholds, that he directs, that he disposes and governs all creatures, all actions, and all things from the greatest even to the least. And when I hear that, I become happy, and I think you too. Aren't we glad that deism is a false theory, a false belief? You see, deists saw God as the great clockmaker in the sky. In their view, God made the universe just like the clockmaker makes his clock. But then the clockmaker winds up the clock and it keeps on ticking by itself. And so, they say, the universe now ticks off just by itself. God is absent. God doesn't care. Of course, deism was especially popular at the time when the Westminster Confession was written. But the Westminster Assembly, based upon the Bible, strongly refuted the deist's views. My brother and sister, just as our Lord Jesus Christ is the author and finisher of your and my faith, as the book of, uh, of Hebrews says, and as Paul tells the Philippians, so is he also the author and finisher of all creation itself. For in him all things hold together, Colossians 7, 1 verse 17, and yes, he sustains all things by his powerful word, Hebrews 1 verse 3. Indeed, God did not just create, but he also cares for all he created. And so, how does that tune your and my mind and emotion about the current climate change theories and observations? Well, that you and I, that man should do what he can do to clean up the, the different kinds of messes by which he has been abusing and exploiting God's wonderful creation. However, even so, our Lord, who is the creator and sustainer of this planet and universe, yes, he is also the sustainer, the perfecter, and finisher of it. So more than human scientist, scientists who at times give conflicting messages, God surely knows with great precision what the extent of climate change is. How much of it is man's doing and how much is not. And when and how to bring this world to an end. And bring in that new heaven and new earth talked about in his word. Well, so far, point one, the extent of God's providence. We come to point two, the goodness of God's providence. We have just heard from God's word that all things are in his hands. However, there's something else that, that should be added. And what's that? Well, that God's actions, that God's actions are good. They are always good. You see, what comfort would the suffering child of God have if he or she does not also remember that all God's dealings to us are good? 
For they come, as the Westminster reminds, from God's most wise and holy providence. Yes, God's actions are never arbitrary. God's actions are never silly nor impulsive. Neither does he react in petty human anger. But if he reacts in anger, it comes as holy anger. And so how beautiful the words of our call to worship. Psalm 145. The Lord is righteous in all his ways. He is kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him. To all who call on him in truth. And how comforting the well-quoted words of Romans 8 verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for their good, for their eternal good. You ask, but pastor, how does God relate to suffering? Yes, to the suffering of his loved ones. Well, my brother and sister, is it not so that in the light of the just quoted Bible verses, there is nothing more comforting for the suffering Christian than the doctrine of God's providence. I mean, let's say I'm suffering from an illness. Then I could, as R.C. Sproul says so well, I could look at this illness as a result of a chance invasion of microorganisms in my body. Or, I can say that even microorganisms are ultimately upheld, directed, and disposed of by the wise and holy providence of God. Yes, if I view my pain, my suffering, my loneliness and grief as just a cosmic accident, then the futility of life exacerbates my pain. However, if I see these painful things as coming to me from the hand of a good, holy, kind, and loving providence with capital P, who is working all things together for my good, I will have reason to endure it. That will, not my, that will not erase my pain, that's true. But it will help me to endure without bitterness. My brother and sister, in this regard, allow me to read a few excerpts from the letter that Guido de Bré wrote to his wife shortly before he was executed for his faith in the 1500s. Of course, as he wrote this letter, this great reformer was wasting away in a dark and stinky jail in Belgium with his arms and legs in heavy chains. So he says, Catherine Ramon, my dear and beloved wife and sister in our Lord Jesus Christ, your anguish and sadness disturb somewhat my joy and the happiness of my heart. So I am writing this for the consolation of both of us, and especially for your consolation, since you have always loved me with an ardent affection. And because it pleases the Lord to separate us from each other, I feel your sorrow over this separation more keenly than mine. I pray you not to be troubled too much over this for fear of offending God. You knew when you married me that you were taking a mortal husband who was uncertain of life, 
And yet it has pleased God to permit us to live together for seven years, giving us five children. If the Lord had wished us to live together longer, he would have provided the way. But it did not please him to do this, and may his will be done. Now remember that I did not fall into the hands of my enemies by mere chance, but through the, through the providence of my God who controls and governs all things, the least as well as the greatest. This is shown by the words of Christ. Be not afraid. Your very hairs are numbered. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And not one of them shall fall to the ground without the will of your father. Then fear nothing. You are more excellent than many sparrows. These words of divine wisdom say that God knows the number of my hairs. How then can harm come to me without the command and providence of God. It could not happen unless one should say that God is no longer God. This is why the prophet says that there is no affliction in the city that the Lord has not willed. And then I jump a few paragraphs in Guido's letter, and he says, it is very true that human reason rebels against this doctrine and resists it as much as possible. And I have very strongly experienced this myself. When I was arrested, I would say to myself, so many of us should not have traveled together, then we would not have been arrested. We were betrayed by this one or that one. We ought not to have been arrested. With such thoughts, I became overwhelmed until my spirits were raised by meditation on the, on the providence of God. Then my heart began to feel a great repose. I began then to say, My God, you have caused me to be born in the time you have ordained. During all the time of my life, you have kept me, and you have preserved me from great dangers, and you have delivered me from them all. And if at present my hour has come in which I will pass from this life to you, may your will be done. I cannot escape from your hands. And even if I could, I would not, since it is happiness for me to conform to your will. These thoughts made my heart cheerful again. I will only read his letter up to here. You see, Guido's letter does not end here. For he says also other God-honoring and tear-pulling things to his wife. But I think we have read enough from this letter to see how these are the words of a godly man who in God's grace had made the doctrine of God's providence totally his own. Yet, so often we, yes, even I as pastor, Forget this when I, for example, complain about my small problems and forget to praise God also for even the smallest blessing. And so it's so easy to sin, just like the ancient Israelites in the desert. Yes, remember when the Israelites were thirsty in the desert and they complained to Moses, why did you bring us up? out of Egypt. Why did you ever do that? So they complained to Moses. But then they even tested God by saying, is the Lord among us or not? 
Do you remember what Moses then to their shame called that place? Well, he gave it a double name. The name Massa and Meriba, which means testing and quarreling. I pray, my brother and sister, that being in awe of the doctrine of God's providence, yes, in awe of even the goodness of his providence, your and my Massas and Meribas will be few and rather replaced by Nora. You ask, but, but what's Nora? Well, remember how Jacob described his Bethel experience where God had appeared to him in a dream? He described that place as, as Nora, which means awesome or awe-inspiring. So how much better if in our hardship you and I can be moved to say from the heart also the following words of Jacob, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. The Lord is also in my suffering and I did not know it. How awesome, how Nora is this place. The last point is shorter, and that is the glory of God's providence. The Westminster Five finishes off by saying he exercises this most wise and holy providence to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. My brother and sister, you and I can fairly easily be moved to praise God for his providence if his providence includes mercy. But can the Christian also be moved to praising God if God's providence includes justice? Yes, when in justice he disciplines even you and me, even his loved ones, as he so often did with ancient Israel? The answer is yes. Yes, the believer who understands that all God's providence is always good and wise can praise, can, can give glory to God even when God in his providence gives justice and not mercy to his loved one. For example, Remember how the boy Samuel was awakened at night. Awakened while he was in the care of Eli. When a voice was calling him by his name, Samuel, Samuel. Remember then how when it happened three times, Eli advised young Samuel to say, Speak, Lord, for your servant listens. Remember then what horrible news God told that boy. And that is that he was going to bring judgment on Eli and his family. And remember what happened the next morning, how Eli responded to this news. Did Eli in anger attack Samuel and, and call him, you rascal? Or did he cry out, that's not fair. No, here is how Eli reacted. He said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. My brother and sister, Eli might have been, he might have had his weaknesses, particularly as a father, but he remained a man of God. So Eli recognized that the sentence coming down on himself and his house manifested God's justice. Eli understood repentance. Thus the child of God gives glory to God's providence even if that providence deals out justice for sins committed. Did not David do the same 
after God, through the prophet Nathan, exposed his sin against Bathsheba and her husband? Remember David's words, which he himself, in awe of God, penned? The words that he wrote so well that even the Apostle Paul quoted them more than 2,000 years, more than a thousand years later. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right, O God, when you speak and justified when you judge. Psalm 51 verse 4. Well, the way Eli and David reacted to God's justice, that was noble and good, and it happened by God's grace. But we know all too well that such good reaction to God's providing justice, that was not very common. Yes, throughout the Old Testament, murmuring and complaining were more the norm. The Old Testament sinners, so much like you and I, struggled to see the invisible hand of God's providence as it was directing their lives. But here is a true word. To walk by faith means to trust the character of God. To walk by faith means to trust the character of God. That means that despite the hardship God is sending me, He is always good and just. That's His character. Look, is that not what Frail Job, thank God, realized when he said, Though He slay me, yet I will trust Him. We want to conclude. My brother and sister, when you and I think of God's providence, let us remember these three things. God's providence governs all creatures, all actions, and all things. That's the extent. God's providence is always good, even when he deals out justice. The true believer is the one who stands in awe of God's providence and praise Him for it. And again, what comes to mind is the refrain in Ephesians chapter 1, to the praise of His glorious grace. And that's the song we will sing after our closing prayer. Amen. Let us